Welcome to our first Creative Caucus, developed to support our new project, The Sea Beneath. The Sea Beneath is an ambitious environmental art, science and heritage project to explore the hidden watercourses and other invisible, unseen and forgotten features beneath the streets of Hastings. Creative Caucus format is experimental. It's about opening out Sea Beneath, asking others for their views, and this conversation will continue through February and March. This Zoom includes short presentations from people who approached us after we went on social media. Um, and once you've seen the presentations, we'll open up the Zoom for discussion. As you watch, ask questions and offer ideas on Zoom chat, and we'll shape the discussion from those messages. The session will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. We'd love the caucus to become a peer-to-peer -peer network. If you agree, we can share your email addresses. With the sea beneath, some of our exploratory work is based on spirit and instinct, some based on science and expert analysis, and we think it likely the two are entwined. In December, we began working with instinct via a wonderful group of dowsers in an initial research and discovery stage in the America ground. Next spring, a discovery day will take place online. More science than instinct, this will explore evidence of old coastlines, earlier harbours and the shape of our town as sea levels rise. The research will be a cue for some small digital arts commissions with the work going on the MSL Smart Heritage Map and on our social channels. Then in April, our event Semaphore takes place on Hastings Seafront in real and virtual space. Semaphore references the performance and installation works of artist, curator, environmentalist and educator Chris Wainwright and artist Anne Lydiat. Semaphore will be updated with key messages about the rising tide we know is coming our way. Hello, my name is Julie and I'm the lead researcher for MSL. I've been asked to give a short introduction to the coastal changes around Hastings. As you can see, the coastline has changed significantly over time. The areas in red on this map are now land which was formed by the natural build-up of shingle across rivers and large embayments. The coastline in the past was far more indented than it is today. This illustration shows Hastings as it was around the time of the Norman Conquest. The inlet is thought to have been the original harbour at Hastings and is where Harold places today with the castle to the right. This 19th century map shows the same area around 1290. You can see the course of the river following the line of Queen's Road. All of this was to change dramatically after a massive storm in 1287, which destroyed the nearby town of Winchelsea, diverted the course of the river Rotha from New Romney to Rye, and caused part of the castle cliff at Hastings to collapse, blocking the harbour. The subsequent build-up of shingle eventually cut off the harbour from the sea and by the 18th century was beginning to be solid enough to build on. This is the area we know today as the America Ground or Trinity Triangle. However, this is still a familiar sight to anyone who lives here. Despite modern efforts to keep the sea at bay, it is still trying to get back in to where it once was. Coastal defence is a huge challenge and with sea levels rising again, this map is a projection of the land that will be lost to the sea by the year 2050. If Julius Caesar or William the Conqueror were to revisit this island then, they would be likely to see a coastline that would be very familiar to them.
Here we are in this beautiful stretch of woods above Hollington Stream. It's full of birds and squirrels and very old trees. But the bank is so steep here going down to the stream that the path was abandoned. But the good thing is that the woods are still here even though narrow because the industrial estate couldn't build itself any closer to the edge. So we can walk along it. If you carry on southward from the four courts, you can walk through Ponswood and all the way down following Hollington Stream where it meets Coombe Haven underneath the Bexhill Road. And from there it's a stone throw to the beach. So all those lovely people living in the four courts could, if they knew about this path, and they might do now because I've cleared it a bit, walk for 35 minutes through nothing but woods alongside the stream, all the way to the sea. This Hollington stream starts just below the ridge, behind Sainsbury's and the drive through McDonald's. And it stays with its woodland either side until it has to go underneath the battle road and then it's covered and you wouldn't know it was there until it comes out again behind the houses along Old Hollington Lane and then past the four courts and into this lovely little wood. It's full of litter now and old soggy sofas but I think that could be cleared up and we can enjoy it for the precipitous path above the stream that it is. Hello and good morning from South Today. Work on a mile-long sewage tunnel under Hastings will come a step nearer to completion today when the giant drilling machine boring the hole returns to the surface. The £43 million project should improve the quality of coastal bathing water, as our East Sussex reporter Phil Wolf reports. The storm tunnel that was built on the eve of the millennium runs underground between Warrior Square and Alexandra Park. At a mile long and seven metres high, it's big enough to drive a double-decker bus through. The tunnel can hold up to 52 million litres of water. Previously, during storms, the rainwater and sewage would be sent untreated out to sea. The storm tunnel acts as flood prevention for our town during high tides and heavy rainfall. So with this basilisk under our feet keeping us safe from flooding, we're safe, right? Well, not necessarily. On the 21st of February 2010, over two inches of rain fell and the tunnel became full to capacity. All 52 million litres. This combined with an exceptionally high tide overcame a manhole on the connection between the pumps and the outfall by Warrior Square, resulting in the underground car park being flooded and over three miles of road were closed by police whilst water was pumped out and the road surface repaired. If you've walked from Alexandra Park to Warrior Square, under your feet lay this dormant beast. Though she remains mostly unseen, out of sight and the minds of the local stinger, there are some who claim to hear her snoring or grumbling. Notably, the vibrations of her purr rattled the houses of the Baybrook Terrace to their very foundations, so much so that some of you may remember a row of houses that existed there two decades ago that were demolished due to the trembling. Some claim that at night time, if they listen carefully, they can still hear her moans. As was proven by the flood of 2010, it is possible that this basilisk under our town may swallow too much. As rainfall increases and the sea levels rise, we may overwhelm the beast. In some ways, this is comparable to some ancient mythology, repentant legends and folklore such as the dormant King Mountain stories wherein the dangerous and selfish impacts of human nature makes furious an otherwise gentle giant, who eventually in fury shakes the town's core and causes floods. For those who have ever heard the rumble beneath or a snore of the beast, we should take the 10th of February 2010 as a warning from her. Leave her to sleep, don't overwhelm her. Blood alert. The seas are rising. 
and so are we. A total of 28 trillion tonnes of ice have disappeared from the Earth's surface in the last 30 years due to global heating triggered by greenhouse gas emissions. This volume of ice would cover the whole of the UK with a sheet of ice 100 metres thick. Scientists have described the level of ice loss as staggering. It equals the worst case scenario forecast of the International Panel for Climate Change, the international body that which oversees global policy on climate action. They warn that sea level rises could reach a metre by the end of the century. That might not sound like much, but combined with high seas, high tides, and increasingly big storm surges, it will lead to much greater risk of flooding in coastal areas and along rivers all over the world. Every centimetre of sea level rise means around a million people will be displaced from low-lying homelands. Just <clears throat> because you live on a hill, Margaret, it doesn't mean you're safe. As the earth heats up and ice caps melt, storms intensify, rivers flow faster, homes and communities are ruined, crops are destroyed and less land is available to produce food. The effect of large-scale migration and food uncertainty already affects many in the global south, as ever those already the most vulnerable, those without privilege, wealth and insurance, those in cheaper dwellings and in worse health with fewer resources will be the worst affected but eventually we will all be affected. The water is rising and so are we. Here's some actions we can take. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Mike Gould. I'm a writer and publisher and uh, back. Um, I wanted to research a screenplay for something I was developing with some writers in Hastings um, around the storm surge in Dungeness. Um, and I had some questions I wanted to ask, which were, what did I know about Dungeness and the power station? The ideas that I'd been inspired by the churning outflow I'd, I'd seen when I went there. And also what would happen if there was a storm surge that affected the station? And, and most of all, was my fiction possible? And I had uh, the events in Fukushima in the back of my mind. Um, so back in 2011, there was the tsunami um, which uh, affected uh, Fukushima, uh, the earthquake, the loss of reactor core cooling, and 154,000 people evacuated. Um, and obviously there was a, a major uh, um, outflow of cesium deposits, which went as far um, as 50, 60, possibly hundreds of kilometers further out. Um, uh, I wondered if it could happen here. Dungeness isn't like Fukushima. There's no serious accidents have been recorded at Dungeness and it's a long way from Hastings. Um, but there are threats. Uh, all nuclear power stations are, tend to be built by water. They only last, spent the last 60 years and that means they are a long time, but they're vulnerable to rising sea levels and other climate change events. Um, so, was it possible? Well, several articles showed that EDF, who, who owned the plant and built the plant, um, had withhold information about uh, a time when they'd actually closed down the reactor not long after the Fukushima event. Um, uh, they admitted that the shingle by the sea was not as robust as previously thought. Um, and there was a theoretical plausible scenario where water could have got onto the site and caused uh, potential problems. Um, is it safe now? Um, it was shut down over two years ago following further safety fears. It's still offline. Um, EDF have themselves invested 200 million in understanding likely uh, impacts um, and worst case scenarios. Even so, the government has extended the site's license to 2028. What does this all mean? Um, whilst the nuclear accident on the scale of Fukushima is unlikely, the fact that they have taken these extreme measures and it's still closed is evidence of their own concerns. It matters to us because Hastings is under 20 miles from Dungeness. Radiation and sea, no, no borders. Hello everyone, it's John Pratty here. Um, so we've had some presentations from everyone, um, a mixture of fact, um, imagination 
um, dreams and all kinds of connections and interesting uh, expositions. What we want to do now is to begin to invite people to talk to us about how you have reacted to what you've heard so far and also your feelings about the subject in general. So this is actually the rest of the Zoom. It's about a discussion. It's about you asking questions. And so I really, really want you to put your questions in the chat panel. You'll see the chat panel at the bottom of your screen in the middle where it says chat. Um, some people are asking questions using the Q&A uh, and I'm not very good at doing several things at once. So I'm going to be monitoring the chat panel. We've already had a couple of really interesting conversation starters and I particularly want to start off. Um, I'd like to actually ask Anna a question, Anna Sabin. Anna, I'm hoping you're, you're there and you are unmuted. Uh, if you haven't unmuted yourself, Anna, can you do so now? I'm unmuted. Great stuff. Um, what did you feel when you saw such a mess in the green, that green landscape that you walked through? Um, what, what, it's, it's a desecration, isn't it? I mean, is it? It, a... it is. Oh, well, I have a theory about, about the litter in, in Hastings. It's, it's, it's an urban place. It's quite densely populated and people drive their cars. I think it makes people very insensitive to their environment. There's, it's overwhelming, the amount of litter. And uh, I think people tiptoe to their cars, pop in, and then they drive right past it. And the people who don't have cars are sort of stuck. They're far less mobile, and they're overwhelmed by the litter as well. And, and it, yes, I, I, I find it extraordinary that people go to the trouble of tipping mattresses and bicycles over the edge when they could just neatly leave it on the street and fairly quickly um, the, 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 the uh, town council will come along and pick it up and take it away for you. But there's a strange gashing sort of idea going on. Um, and of course, we've got howling winds come through Hastings as well. So even if you're trying to be neat with your litter, Mars bar wrappers are being snatched from your hands on the way to the bin. <laughs> so, so yeah, we have a lot of litter and, and a lot of unlove for our beautiful place. We seem what to go on. What does that mean in terms of uh, how we are likely to care for the environment going forwards if we walk through an, uh, a landscape like that and see the mess? I mean, does it make you feel, uh, I mean, is, is it, are our younger generations likely to actually care for the environment in the way that we're talking about right now in the, in the course of this discussion? I think they have to be taken out, don't they? They have to be allowed out. Um, uh, uh, right now, they can't actually have a life outdoors on their own. They, they have to remain supervised till they're 13 when they're, because the streets are so dangerous and you have to cross the streets before you can get to the woods and the sea. Uh, it, it, it should be much more friendly for children to explore, to be in, to live in. And, and then they would care. They care a lot and they could be encouraged to care at school and by their parents and so on. We, we could make life much better for everybody, I'm sure. But yeah. More sensitivity, that's what you need. More sensitivity in everyone. All right, thank you. That's fantastic, Anna. Um, I want to come to Julia Hilton in a moment, but, but first I want to talk to some of the other people who presented. Um, Mary Hooper and Jane Bruce, can you unmute yourselves? Yep. That's fantastic. Jane, what, what, what kind of things were you thinking about when you were making this piece? It's very free form, wasn't it? It was a, a genuine piece of digital art. What, what were your thoughts as you produced a piece of work with Mary? And I'll ask Mary the same question again in a second. Um, I think I was thinking um, of actually water just coming up out the ground and bringing with it all sorts of amazing, which I didn't get time to put in, uh, objects and stories, uh, as well as bringing a grim time for everyone who's being encompassed by the water. But the other side of it is the, if you like, the archaeological interest of what that might be, I think, and how the climate change is definitely going to make it happen very soon. And that's back of my mind, I think. Great. That was really interesting. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's it's got good things within it. But it's um, really interesting. Mary, what were your thoughts when you were producing the piece of work? I I wanted to think about how globally, you know, the 
the impact of glaciers melting, the water currents, the wind currents that go around the globe, connecting, it doesn't mean anything to us on the whole, unless you're plugged into that, um, in terms of our local situation. So I wanted to kind of refer to that in, in um, an evocative way, and hence all the different types of water recording, plus all the sources of water. We've got the sea, we've got the rain, we've got all the water, domestic water that drains into, we've got pollution. I live um, opposite Alexandra Park. You've got Old Royal Gill feeding in through uh, what was the, the the river that fed into the harbour. And and um, I did a lot of work with Julie on the first bit and that, and that flooding right up through Queen's Road how long, Julie? Only a couple of hundred years ago. <laughs> so yes, yeah, sorry, two two hundred years ago. Yeah, and and you know the 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 sort of accretion of land and shingle through great storms, and then is is quite fascinating emotionally. We 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 want to live on the edge of the land, you know, because of that sea, that view, that open horizon, and we and a lot of that real estate around there was. Um, you know, developers just taking advantage of a situation, and now now we're clinging on. You know, and we're, you know, we're destroying, we collectively the human race, destroying the environment. So I I just wanted to, without preaching, because that just turns people off, but create something evocative that then might feed into somebody else's work about. Okay, so is this us? Right, wake up. What what are what can we do? And often actions are so big and overwhelming that we just switch off again. Yeah, mm. that's quite a that's that's a big that's a big list of things. To... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Um, oh, I want, no, wrong. I want now to come across to um, Julia Hilton. Julia, can you unmute yourself? Um, Julia. Uh, it may be well, maybe very familiar to, to members of the local Green Party uh, and other people who know her interest in the environment. Um, Julia, you've uh, made some comments on the on the Q and A bit about. Um, um, here we go. Where's the question? Well, Julia, can you remind me of your question? Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for the presentations. Um, my question. Yeah. What did I? Well, there were a couple of things. One was. Um, I've often, I've also been thinking about the unsung um, streams of Hastings. So I was really enjoy, enjoyed Anna's um, presentation. Um, but I was also been really shocked um, at how I went and looked at the EPA, Environment Protection Agency figures on our water quality of our streams and it's terrible. Um, so I think that's something, and they, and they do feel very unloved and actually Hastings is, is full of you know, it's got old rural gill, which hardly anyone, people who live near there know it, but a lot of people in Hastings don't know of its existence. And, Hollington, and the Hollington stream, again, is, yeah, is local people know. I've often thought we should we should um, map that. But the other thing is um, that whole changing, the changing coastline and the fact, I mean, in Hastings, you, you can't see it anymore, but you can see geology in action if you go further along to, to Camber and to Pet. Um, you can see how the coast has moved on, on the shingle and I would really like to see it. Um, and then, cause I'm interested in, in also how we come up with not good ways of dealing with, with flooding, which cities are now using this, this terrible term, sustainable urban drainage, which sounds very dull, but actually can involve trees and planting. Um, almost, and almost actually re, we can't bring back the harbor. Well, maybe we could bring back the harbor, um, but to think about how we reveal that, that, history beneath our feet back again I suppose is something I'm really interested in how we and how we use that to acknowledge that yes we need to work we need to be much more we need to have a much different relationship with the water both that comes down through the hills and also um, the sea and and it's pretty key being a seaside place um, and mostly at the moment we just have these big seawalls to deal with it but actually maybe there's a maybe there's a better way to accommodate the future changes so that's a positive a bit, a bit rambling. That's positive isn't it i mean you're, you're actually talking about positive approaches to engineering the rise in sea levels and the increase in groundwater and uh, uh, it seems to me that there's an awful lot of 
negative discussion or discussion which is likely to raise our own levels of anxiety without necessarily uh, beginning to invest in re-engineering the landscape, re-engineering the coastline. And in your case, you've been talking about sustainable urban drainage, haven't you? Well, could you say, tell us a bit about how things like suds might help this rising tide coming under our feet? Very briefly. It's more to do with actually how, how, it, how we deal with the increasing rainfall as we've all suffered this winter and others. Um, and it's happening more and more now that basically you can use trees and plantings. And um, one of the schemes that's really worth having a look at if anyone wants to look at some beautiful planted pictures is the Sheffield Greater Green Scheme where they've run ribbons of planting right through the town now um, and uh, integrated walking and cycling uh, routes. So now people actually make their walks through the town. They, they, they actually go out of their way to be able to walk these particular routes. And it actually has cost less than what they used to pay in terms of maintaining tarmac and gutters and drains. And they have these beautiful linear plantings that cope with all the stormwater. And so um, that's something I hope we might be able to bring to Hastings as part of the Garden Town bid. But I think there are, what I want to, I'm, uh, climate change is a very scary thing, but there, are, there is stuff, even if, we, even if we stopped emitting now, there are going to be changes we have to deal with, um, especially at the, at the sea. And we need to be thinking creatively about that, about how that can make our town and our awareness of the landscape um, more obvious for people so it's a positive thing not a oh my god it's all awful I mean it is there's lots of dreadful stuff but mm -hmm. that tends to make us all go and hide under a blanket um, I'm much more interested in how we how we engage with that and 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 bring nature into the town in a way that we understand it and we engage with it and we work with it and that right. then becomes yeah. a much more beautiful place for us Thank all you very much. no that's absolutely great I think it's great to see the 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 what we can do to work with this. I want now to come across to Rosa Tor. Um, thank you very much, Julia. Rosa, can you un unmute yourself? Yeah. And uh, Cripes, tell us a bit more about the rumblings under the town. This yeah. sounds like the kind of thing that we're talking about when we talk about the psychogeography of Hastings. Uh, I, I, I used to live near Brighton, London Road Station in Brighton, about a quarter of a mile away, and I could hear the trains at night and it was really disturbing. But you're talking about people who could actually hear and feel what was going on under their feet from the storm drain. Yeah. Uh, what was yeah. your interest in that? Well, yeah, so I, um, my interest peaked when I went over to a friend's house who lives um, next to Warrior Square. And he said that a neighbor of his was kept up at night because she lives in a basement apartment and she can hear this sort of incessant rumbling coming from under the floorboards and I was thinking that is the most petrifying terrifying thing I could ever <laughs> imagine um and it sort of made me feel like there was this living organism or living thing kind of underneath our feet as we were walking around Hastings so that captivated my imagination um and it got me to thinking I'm, I'm quite interested in in kind of folklore and also folklore's efficacy um, in, con in its contribution towards sort of um, activism or um, kind of uh, political discussions or discourse um, in that I do think it captivates that part of our imagination and I think it's um, it's you know to sort of as I was sort of walking around Hastings with this new knowledge of this sort of rumbling beast under our feet I then just started to research it um, and I found that it had in fact as I mentioned in the um, presentation flooded so there is this potential for this beast to sort of kind of cough up everything that's inside of it and it's you know carries 52 um, million liters of water so there's got to be some kind of quantity of water inside that thing um, and you know there are a lot of sort of um, repentant kind of tales in mythologies where nature acts back at human beings and so, sort of puts our puts our wrongs right again through acts of you know I, I mentioned the, the King Mountain and that's um, this myth um, I think it I think it might be an Eastern European myth of this um, of, of the king spirit that lives inside the mountain and when wars take place on its um, grounds 
uh, landslides occur and it's they they took it to be that this 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 spirit inside this mountain was just going you know it was was putting human nature right uh, right again um and so yeah i just started to think of how that could uh how we could start to think about our hastings and our town as much as we have you know we, we're a town that is kind of the folklore and the myths that surround us are um part of being a hastings resident is our connection to you know jack and the green festival and um you know such things that take place the morris dancing and the, the face painting and you know this connection that we have to nature but now that we've created this infrastructure around us that is potentially collapsing how can we sort of knowing that we are a collective or community of people whose imaginations are sort of ignited by this folklore that we have in our culture how can we use that to um effectively sort of ignite a, a feeling someone put in the chat um that um their six-year-old son said are those snakes real um <laughs> I think that kind of you know um childlike response of, of um fear towards a big beast is a lot more easy to conjure up or to ignite in people than you know there's a really big you know like 52,000 you know it's kind of very dry boring facts about about infrastructure in town I think there has to be some kind of um imagination and creativity involved as well so that six-year-old kids go I don't want to wake the beast up let's let's you know do what we need to do to ensure that sea sea levels don't rise as fast as um they're, they're said to now so yeah that's a fascinating approach to it, Rosa. It's a really fantastic idea. I'd love to see a map of Hastings with all of the monsters underneath. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, if I can put that together and send it along to everybody, I could sort of um, draw up a map and send that along. Well, I think that's that's a really great idea. Absolutely. I think there are all sorts of beasts around, but there you are. Uh, monsters and creatures of all sorts. I want to go now briefly to Ken Davis. Ken, can you unmute yourself? And Ken has asked a question. Um, what we can do is hold a competition to invite different visions for the town, which will accommodate future flooding, illustrated by local artists, of course. Tell us about your idea. That sounds great. <laughs> which <laughs> idea is this? <laughs> or vision for the town? Um, yeah, I mean, about uh, uh, what kind, how, how would we make a competition asking people to redesign the town? I mean, would it be for young people? Would it be a serious competition? Yeah, it would be serious, yes, but why not? Especially young people, of course. Great. Um, you know, they'll be the ones carrying the can, won't they? Long, <laughs> I'll be long gone. But um, yeah, I have a particular vision for the town and I would put in an entry and I think it's great. What I like about this most is that there are there are now what I sometimes call these fluffy, arty, farty people talking about technical stuff. It's great. That's what we need to do because we can use we can use art mm. to explain these things. As Rosa was just saying, I think that's, you know, to just present the hard facts doesn't really sink into people. But I think to tell stories and to tell the history um, is maybe the way to go because, you know, we need to get other people on board with this. Um, so visions, you know, to a competition that could invite some different visions and then people could vote for them and, you know, decide which were the better ones, weigh up the pros and cons. It would start a dialogue and a discussion. Um, and maybe we could go somewhere with that. Um, great. What would you say your vision, what, what's your, what's your plan then? What's your vision? Oh God. explanation. In one short sentence. One short, my vision is 2066 city. Right, now that will, that's just the vision. That's to get you thinking about it, but I would gladly explain it a bit more if people want some more detail, because there's a lot uh, to it. Are you, gonna, are you gonna work with the rising sea levels or are you gonna try and keep them out? I think you you can't avoid letting them in because while everyone talks about rising sea levels, what we tend to forget are the intense rainfall uh, periods that we're going to have and will be very difficult to deal with because at the moment when we talk about this tunnel under the seafront and all the culverts running back through the town, which there are, they're all operated by pumps. Mm. Um, so very dependent on having the power there and if those pumps fail then we'll get flooding of the town which has happened in any case 
you know, the cricket ground used to flood regularly back in the early 70s. Mm. Um, so the town centre, the Victorian town centre will flood first for sure. So I think we should uh, have a, a system to gradually abandon that and put something else in its way, which, which would be more trees and planting running up the valley. Excellent. Um, but those uh, buildings need to be relocated somewhere else. Well, shopping centres can be anywhere, can't they? But if you can't put a cricket... Well, they are. They are. Shopping centres are everywhere else around the town, aren't they? They're outside the town, mostly. Yeah. Do we need a big shopping centre? No, we don't. Hmm. OK, well, uh, well, I think I agree with you on that one. I'm <laughs> excited about shopping centres. Um, so we're just... Thank you very much, Ken. That was very thought-provoking. And I think we need to think about how other people interface with arts initiatives like this yeah um, absolutely and absolutely this is really about um how all of us who live in the town understand how rising sea levels affect our lives and the engineering of the the landscape around us um, now we've got a couple more presentations to come up um, i just wanted to ask felix a question now felix could you unmute and tell us a bit more about what you thought about when you were making your presentation. I mean, in relation to perhaps you're the younger generation and young people, I mean, what kind of world are we leaving for young people? Do, do things like climate, uh, the climate emergency give you a positive feeling or do you think that we're, what are we doing? Are we educating people enough for this? Um. <clears throat> Uh, I don't see it, no, uh, unfortunately. Um, we, uh, yeah, no, I, I, there's not enough happening soon enough. Uh, we all want one thing and institutions and people in charge are doing the opposite. It, there seems to be a massive disconnect between uh, where we're going and where we kind of know where we should be going. And um, so something will probably have to break rather than um, uh, be managed, unfortunately. So it's a future of managing accidents, managing disasters, uh, unfortunately. I, I hope that's not too grim. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Right, um, I'm going to come across now to, just going to open up my questions here and go to, oh, we've asked, we've answered Julia, we've talked to Julia. I want to open the floor up. I mean, we haven't actually had many questions from other people present in the, in the Zoom. So can I have some questions, please, from other people? You know what to do. Um, go to chat and when you're doing your chat, raise your hand. So I want to see some more questions from people at this point. Now, I'd like to ask Anne Lydiat. Anne, could you unmute yourself? Anne Lydiat. Um, would be great to talk to Anne Lydiat briefly about project we're going to be mounting in the spring. Anne, can you unmute? Yep. Hi Anne, could you tell us a little bit about the Semaphore project and its past and its present and its future in relation to what we're going to be doing? Just really quickly. Yeah, um, I'm going to put a presentation together to provide visuals for next week, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, just to go through it, um, my husband and I, uh, Chris Wainwright, my name's Anne Lydiat, and we have for several years been working with uh, climate and obviously, uh, well, we've been in Japan quite a lot of time and did a lot of work up in the areas that were affected by Fukushima and worked with the local communities there to actually help them to begin to deal with the trauma of what had happened to them and to involve them and to make them part. And Chris and I made a piece that has now become a bit of an icon called We Are All Stars, uh, because the Japanese did believe that all those that were 
drowned actually did become stars. So I'm just finding ways because there's a lot of mental illness uh, in Japan and they've been rehoused in what we would have called prefabs, but they're almost like prison blocks. And so the people are intensely traumatized. They've lost everything. I mean, some of them, you know, just unimaginable, not just flooded, but just their homes and their loved ones just disappearing. But interestingly, even before Fukushima, Chris and I did a piece up at Aoyama right at the top of Japan. And uh, I was just thinking when I was looking at, I can't remember who it was as presentation about flood. Um, we did a piece, signal piece with flood. And we did a piece called Rise that Chris filmed me signaling uh, R-I-S-E um, using the torches that Margaret and I have talked about um, using. So yeah, using the signaling system. Um, just before I came on air, I was just think, having a look at what uh, the sea beneath us, so uh, T-S-B-U. So I think it would be really good if we started to use the signal underneath some of the words. So like flood, we might do the semaphore for flood so that, that we start to use that mechanism as a way of communication, which is obviously extant now, it's not, it's not used. So it's using non-technical. That was the thing that Chris and I felt quite passionate about, what happen, happens if every other technical means of communication disappears, that signaling is one thing that, that you can communicate uh, with. So I, I have some quite, we did something outside, we did a piece outside Dungeness and also there's a really good little um, film uh, that we made at Oldborough. We did uh, a, a semaphore piece there called What Has to Be Done and uh, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, the Scottish guy who uh, did a small film outside the uh, nuclear power station there. So there's lots and lots of material I can share with you either next time or to uh, send out to people. But yeah, lots of lots of visual, ex hopefully exciting images um, that, that might kind of inspire or uh, give a kind of context for some of the things that people have been talking about today. Thanks for all your presentations, by the way. I did see them all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne. That sounds amazing. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the piece. Um, I'd like to come across to Jill Rock now. Jill, are you, are you listening? Can you unmute yourself? Oh, there I am. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I love, Jill has posed a question on the chat saying, hello, I propose we remove the seaside roads and allow yeah. the waters into a seas series of inner harbours, i.e. Warrow Square, Priory Meadow, The Bourne, car traffic would be redirected from the outer ring into the town. I think you mean that the other way around, don't you? So yeah, I mean, to come, the traffic comes down from the outer ring into the town rather than from the sea. It seems to me that uh, the best way of working with water is to work with the way that it works. What water needs, we need to get rid of the concrete. And so the immediate piece of concrete we need to get is the seaside road for all sorts of reasons beyond controlling. Then we can actually have areas which absorb water and we can redirect water into the places where there was originally water, like mm. Warrior Square, like the Bourne, like Prior, but in a controlled way. And there are plenty of water engineers who can, I'm, I'm just a, an artist, I just have ideas. <laughs> and, um, I have worked with water before, but I'm not for a while. I work with wood, basically. But it seems to me that we have to think about what water does. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of Hastings and St. Leonard's is actually reclaimed land. Mm. Why not put it back? to what it was, and I live in Warrior Square. I'd love to have a harbour out there. <laughs> um, that's basically an off the top of my head idea. I think it's a great idea. Um, right, we're going to, um, that's the kind of thing that we're, we're really going to need to start doing. I mean, it's great actually in a way that your idea follows on from what Ken was talking about, about working with the sea, working with climate change and re-engineering the coastline in an 
intelligent way. And you've, you've hit on the same thing, haven't you? Um, I'd like to move along a little bit now because we have only nine minutes left and we have a couple of presentations to fit in. Um, uh, any other questions? I'm just looking for another couple of questions. It would be good to fit one more question in before we uh, go to anything else. Um, oh, perhaps I'm not. I'm actually going to say that all of the chat questions and all of the chat remarks are going to be saved. Um, so we're archiving this whole uh, shebang. We're archiving the questions and we're ask, ask, archiving the answers and the questions as well and the chat and the whole thing. Um, I want to just briefly ask Julie, Julie Gidlow. Um, Julie, can you unmute briefly? Are you there? Yep, I'm here. What are your thoughts about what we've just been hearing about returning to the old uh, coastline? I mean, there's plenty yeah. of evidence about the old coastline, isn't there? What can you say about that? There is. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to say, personally, I agree with Jill. I think it would be much nicer to live in a town that had these natural inlets and harbours. And um, I'd kind of quite like to see a return to that as well. Um, Ken actually added um, a note to Jill's comment about um, removing the seafront roads, um, that the original road into Hastings ran along the ridge and came down um, into the old town, which is the old London road. That's the original route into the town. And uh, so that, that's the, the first route that was there. Um, and what we're seeing along the seafront is basically that conflict between what the sea wants to do, where the sea wants to be, and what humans want to do with the land. So the reason that we've landed up with um, some of the roads that we've got today um, is that the roads were deliberately built to create easier access between Hastings and St Leonard's um, when St Leonard's started growing as a town from the early 1830s onwards. Um, so there's always this conflict between human habitation, what humans need, um, and what the natural environment is trying to do as well. So we, we, we see that a lot. Um, it looks to me, looking at the maps that I had in my presentation, the projection from Climate Central is that we will be looking at a flooding very similar to what was in this area um, a thousand years ago, maybe 2000 years ago. Um, and a lot of that flooding initially happened because of the melting of the, of the glaciers after the, the Ice Age. Um, so the, the sea levels were initially a lot lower because the ice obviously had frozen all the, all the water. Um, once the glaciers started um, melting and the sea levels started rising, we landed up with huge amounts of, of uh, in, in sea embayments coming into the into the land and when you look at what used to be sea a thousand years ago and what is projected to be sea in a very short period of time we are actually looking at the same picture we've gone full circle back to that um so it's in a way it is part of a natural process as well um yeah. we do have to ask ourselves the question of you know obviously we have a lot of needs on that land ourselves and we can't just go back to how the land was when it was very sparsely inhabited. Um, so that's in, it, in, isn't it? We, we, can, we can't go back, we've got to go forwards. Mm, yeah, we need uh, a compromise. <laughs> I'm going to, we're going to call in a late presenter now. We've got two more presentations, um, very quick ones. Um, we're going to hear now from Judith Ricketts, an artist, a digital artist and lecturer in digital art at Brighton Polytechnic. Um, and Judith is going to talk to us um, about mapping, mapping his mapping. Uh, Judith, you do you you tell us tell us what you're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about mapping time. I, I think um, this might be a bit of a spanner in the works, but I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. Yeah, it's a quick <laughs> uh, moving image. <laughs> Hello, my name is Judith Ricketts. I'm a new media artist, a serious games developer, and a lecturer in digital media at the University of Brighton. My practice is thematically centred on the spatial memory of the city's built environment as an intersectional backdrop to examine data as it relates to the gaze. The gaze inhabits very specific positioning for those of us from the African Caribbean diasporas. 
Intrinsic to our history is a story of the sea and the movement of people to the Americas, born of an idea of the other. Amongst some of the questions raised in my practice relates to ways in which time can be mapped through digital and physical geographies in order to engage audiences with difficult subjects. Data-driven converging lines through time and space can tell a story from one place about another. The correlation between old shipping lanes and contemporary subterranean data superhighways is a rich telling ground for data, mythologies and visual communication. This work by Stephen Walker mirrors the work in my practice and it traces the past events in physical geographies. My take on this creative caucus is associated with cartographic mythologies of the sea beneath our feet, mapping time in a subterranean world modelled through data and the idea of belonging. Thank you for listening. There you go. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Judith. I'm just going to introduce mm -hmm. Evgenia from um, Rai. Uh, and I want Evgenia to rec over to talk about the project which is just about to begin, a very exciting project, which is very similar to what we're doing with the sea beneath, but somewhat bigger in ambition. So Yevgenia, would you yes, like sir. to begin? Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, inviting me um, to join this caucus. It's really great to connect with so many um, so many like-minded, uh, passionate people. I'm not going to take up a lot of your time because I know we're running out of it, but yes, I represent an organization called Climate Art. I wish I was from Rye. I'm actually based in London, uh, but our, <laughs> our project um, um, is uh, in Rye. It's yeah, very similar. It's called um, A Vanished Sea Without a Trace. Um, and that's the title for a residency project that we'll be running in uh, Rye this spring. Um, we, it was originally going to be earlier, but obviously we had to move things around because of COVID. And that's, um, as I said, it's a residency project that we're managing. Um, we have, through an open call, recruited three um, artists and multidisciplinary practitioners. Um, one of them is based in Hastings. He's an architect. His name is Joseph Williams. Um, he builds structures out of uh, sustainably sourced uh, bamboo. He might be familiar to some of you, who, of those of you who are based in Hastings. Um, we've got a visual and installation artist, Alistair Debling, and Mo Langmuir, who is a, uh, actually a marine biologist, um, but she's bringing in a lot of um, creativity into her practice. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop um, a link to our website into the chat. Um, uh, so you can find out a little bit more about the residency, but essentially um, what we've done is we've used um, Camber Castle near I as sort of a metaphor for um, our sense of um, transience and ephemerality and change that sort of pervades um, the world around us. And it, it obviously, as we all know, um, the only constant thing in life, I guess, is change. Um, and uh, with Camber Castle being uh, built sort of on the, on the uh, shoreline um, in Henry VIII's time and being decommissioned within a hundred years of its construction because sea has receded and, and, the, and the castle is sort of stranded inland. Um, so we've used that, um, that image and that place as a metaphor for the residency and we're inviting the artists to respond to that. And they've, they're all looking at different types of things within uh, different types of structures and phenomena within the, within the environment of, of Rye. Um, Alistair is looking at Camber Castle and comparing that to Dungeness Power Station, another de decommissioned structure. Um, Mo is looking at microscopic organisms in the sea. Joseph is looking at a refugee crisis and um, the connection between between what's happening there and climate change. So it's going to be a really rich creative response. They're going to spend three months in in uh, Rye in residence, uh, working in response to to the landscape and to um, 
local environment and um, a really important part of our project and what we are all about as climate art is really involving the public um, in the conversation um, and of course also looking at sort of scientific and um, um, approach to things I, it sort of relates to what Ken was saying earlier about sort of artsy people coming in and uh, illustrating um, ideas around climate change um, we really want to make sure that instead of sort of just mere kind of illustration we we, we create a space for dialogue and collaboration um, and we we're, we're really excited about what's going to happen and how the artists are going to respond um, to to this challenge um, and they are all very keen to collaborate um, and to work closely and to listen to local communities and to invite people to co-create, to criticize, um, to engage in dialogue. Um, so there's going to be plenty of opportunity to do that. Uh, so please do follow. I'm going to do a bit of plug in a bit of self-promotion, you know, follow the project, uh, keep in touch. Um, if you've got ideas um, or questions, um, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to get involved. Um, with the artists and with our project. So um, stay tuned and we watch this space. Thanks very much, Evgenia. That's fantastic. It sounds like an interesting project. And um, obviously in a very uh, part of the country where climate change and the moving coastline left a really big harbour project in the Victorian mm -hmm. area completely becalmed. We have to wrap it up now. Um, I can see that Jill has a question, but Jill, we actually have to stop. Um, no. <laughs> we are going to, we're just asking Yabinya to put a, uh, a link into her project, and she has. So there we are, climateart.org.uk. So thank you to everyone for taking part. Thank you to the panellists and the presenters who created their pieces of work and were very kind enough to put their, their pieces together and spend some time thinking about what the sea beneath means and what it means in terms of heritage and culture and nationality and all of those things which uh, which we've heard about. We are going to be cre creating some pieces ourselves next. We will be looking at um, a discovery day in February or March and the Semaphore project will happen in, 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 in April. Please look out for the YouTube recording of this Zoom conversation and I'm now going to hand over to our end piece. We thank Arts Council England for funding the project and also Trinity Triangle Heritage Action Zone um, and a range of other funders uh, for making this collaboration possible. Thanks very much to everyone for taking part and I'm going to say goodbye from me and goodbye from all of the panellists and presenters. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.